I feel like I killed the doggy talk. Like that was so lovely. <laughs> I will say, Elizabeth, my parents just got a dog and I know you like the uh, music names. So um, their new dog is Boudlo. So after Boudlo Bryant, um, I would guess if they get a new dog, it'll be Felice to go with that, but we'll see. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, he's a, a Louisiana something. I can't remember the name, but um, he is, he's a little mess and their, their empty nester life is now full of uh, Boudlo, so. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's such a great dog name too, though. Like that is so perfect. We, yep. oh yeah, all of my pets, since I like, not that we had this when I was a kid, but since I have been the one in control have been named after musicians. So I had fish in college. Um, I had Barry White and Aretha Franklin in the beta fish. And then I had um, Stevie Ray Vaughan, another beta fish who lived like forever. And, um, and the new kids on the block were a group of guppies that we had for a while. <laughs> also. I love it. Were they, I mean, like, you fitting for that name? Is that really the right name for those guppies? <laughs> Um, it was really hard to keep them alive. So I, don't know. I mean, maybe that was a testament to the short-lived nature of their career and the maybe. ephemeral, I mean, uh, no the ephemeral nature of pop music. I mean, it was really a, it was a metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, I'll get us started. <laughs> Um, thank you everybody for being here. I know we've still got some folks trickling in uh, and we'll keep that going, but uh, I just want to make sure that we get started. I'm very excited for today. My name is Kipa Patel and I am a doctoral candidate in the Arts Administration Education and Policy Department. Uh, and I've been able to work on a wonderful project called the Burnett Symposium Speaker Series this semester to help bring a variety of thought leaders to the conversation um, and, and folks into this virtual space. So thank you for joining us in Zoom land and joining us today. Uh, I'm really excited about this talk and our speaker, The Magic is in the Middle, Philanthropy and the Future of Music in American Cities with Elizabeth Colleen. Thank you so much for being here. I just wanna go over the format and then I will hand this off so that we can have everybody um, get us introduced and started. So just quick things about the session overview. I wanna make sure that I uh, thank everybody that helped make this possible. Uh, thank you to Brittany Shelton, to Lauren Pace, Michelle Adias, um, Dr. Sushana Goldberg-Miller, Dr. Christine Belgian morris and Dr. Rachel Skaggs for helping really brainstorm and make sure that we could get this off the ground and piloted this semester. It's really been wonderful to uh, see what's possible in this iteration and to hopefully grow this over time. Um, and then just so everybody knows the format, we're going to have Elizabeth present um, for about 45 minutes to an hour, and then we will have a Q&A session at that point. You can definitely use the chat feature. You can include questions in there. We'll answer all those at the end of the session. Uh, if you'd like to actually have your video up and actually talk at the end of the session, please just message me. I'm happy for us to make sure that happens and I can make that happen in the actual screen. Uh, we are recording the session, so that should have started right when you join. Uh, and then also, if you need closed captioning services, please make sure at the bottom of your screen or however you're viewing this on the Zoom kind of platform, you turn on that closed captioning so you can see the live transcription happening for everyone. Uh, we're so glad you're here. Welcome, everyone. This is a really wonderful opportunity. And I'm going to um, have the great honor to hand this off to the chair of our department, Dr. Karen Hutzel, to uh, share the vision of the Barnett Symposium Speaker Series and, and how we started and got to this moment. So. Dr. Hutzel, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. Thanks, Kettle. <clears throat> and thank you for launching this um, pilot project we have uh, with the Barnett Symposium Speaker Series in a virtual spread out format for the first time. Um, let me just say a little bit about the history of our Barnett Speaker Series. Um, so in 1993, two endowed funds were established by Lawrence Barnett and Isabel Bigley Barnett to support our arts policy and administration program in AAEP. One aspect of this endowment was the development of the Biennial Barnett Symposium, which was created to facilitate in-depth inquiry and analysis of public and not-for-profit sector policies and practices. Harold Williams, the president of the J. Paul Getty Trust at the time, presented a lecture at the inaugural symposium in May of 1993. And in his talk, he described the evolution and complex nature of the federal, state, and local arts 
support network and its significance for arts education policy formulation. Williams emphasized the interrelatedness of the arts and arts education, as well as the close linkage of arts education policy formulation to the overall reform <clears throat> of public education. So fast forward more than 25 years later, and as we were planning for um, an in-person symposium for last autumn, um, COVID happened and uh, we ceased planning. And, and it took us nearly a year to recover, to figure out um, how we wanted to proceed to continue um, honoring this endowment, but also acknowledging the, um, the work that is happening in present day, the scholarship that's happening in present day. And so we have um, launched this virtual format um, with the hopes and plan that it could continue well beyond this time period with the addition of um, an in-person symposium that may happen every two or three years as well. Um, so we're, this is the second speaker of, our, uh, of the month and we're really excited to have her. Um, but what I'm going to do is turn it over to um, one of our other Barnett named endowments. We have quite a few that we're thankful for. Um, our Barnett Endowed Assistant Professor of Arts Management, Dr. Rachel Skaggs, will introduce um, today's speaker. Um, she brings a sociological expertise and lens to examine the role of art in society. And her research has focused on topics such as the importance of social networks in museum industry careers, arts entrepreneurship, and the public perceptions of artists in local communities. So Dr. Skaggs, I'm gonna turn it over to you and um, thank you both for um, providing this for us today. Thanks so much, Dr. Hutzel. Um, so I will go ahead and introduce our speaker for the day, Elizabeth K. Wine. Um, Elizabeth is the founder and executive director of Music Export Memphis, which is a nonprofit export office that creates opportunities for musicians and drives economic development through music and culture. So I first heard Elizabeth speak at a music tourism conference years ago about her work using this music export model to support developing musicians in her city and to get the word out about Memphis's contemporary music scene. I bought in immediately. Um, so if you've taken any one of my classes, it's very likely that I've told you about the excellent work Elizabeth's doing in the music world. As a music advocate and strategist, Elizabeth leads through building community. She leads brand experience work for Memphis Brand, has worked in music publicity and strategy since 2011 through her own boutique agency, Signal Flow PR, and has spent two years leading the expansion of international music policy consultancy, Sound Diplomacy, into the United States. Elizabeth is also an adjunct professor at Rhodes College, teaching music urbanism, a course that she developed for the Mike Curb Institute for Music, which is another connection because I also came from a school with a Curb program. Um, in 2015, she was honored by the British Council at its inaugural Education UK Alumni Awards, celebrating outstanding US alumni of British institutions. And in 2020, she was named to Memphis, Memphis Business Journal's 40 Under 40. Elizabeth is dedicated to the belief that smart cities are music cities. She's spoken on the topic at Music Cities Convention, uh, South by Southwest, Americana Fest, Canadian Music Week, Folk Alliance, at Texas Sound and Cities as a keynote speaker, and in her TED Talk, um, which has over 1.4 million views. So it's my immense pleasure to introduce and welcome you today, Elizabeth. I'm so excited for your talk and I'm ready to listen. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Skaggs. That was an awesome introduction. Um, I'm just going to um, share my screen so that we can dive right in um, and talk about music in cities. Um, so I, I had all these notes about that I was going to share or things about myself, but uh, Dr. Skaggs did such an amazing job of, of really kind of hitting the highlights. Um, you know, I, I think that the thread that kind of goes through all of my professional experience to date um, and something that I'd really want you to know about me as we start this talk is that throughout my career, I've really just been dedicated to the music middle class. Um, 
we're going to talk about a lot of middles today, um, but that's the that's the place where we're going to start. You know, as I was working in music PR, um, I was focused on working with independent artists um, and independent record labels who really are the the heart of the music middle class in a lot of cities. Um, as I was working with Sound Diplomacy, um, you know, my biggest concern was how does the average musician who's working in a city, living and working in a city, um, building their livelihood in a city, you know, how do they benefit from this? Um, and of course, that is really a North Star of our work with Music Export Memphis as well. So that's where we're going to start. Um, what is a music middle class and why do our cities need one? I will tell you because I'm a, a shameless promoter of Memphis. Um, uh, that all of the photos that you'll see, uh, or just about all the photos you'll see in today's PowerPoint are artists that Music Export Memphis has supported in some way. And uh, if you're interested in discovering new music, I'll point some of them out as well and uh, let you know about them. This is Marcella Simeon. She is originally from Lafayette, Louisiana, the daughter of Zydeco legend, Grammy, multiple Grammy award winner, Terrence Simeon. She moved to Memphis to go to art school for visual art and discovered our music community and has been a Memphian ever since. Uh, and that is her playing her accordion at our Americana Fest showcase. So love to give shout outs to these musicians that we support. Okay, so music middle class. What the heck is it? Why do cities need it? You know, of course, it's easy enough to define, right? Um, it's working musicians, touring musicians who make a middle class living. But let's take a look a little bit at the bigger picture because I think this is important to understand. So there's a tier of artists or musicians, and some of these numbers that I'm going to throw out, these percentages are for the sake of this illustration. I don't have exact data on this, right? But there's this tier of artists or musicians who were always going to move to an industry hub city, somewhere like LA, New York, Nashville. They were always going to do that because they needed to be where their management publicist, label, producer, et cetera, um, were all, you know, living next door to each other, going to lunch at the same places and had that interconnectedness. Uh, and there's a bottom group, um, let's say 30%, uh, who I like to call hobbyists and hustlers, uh, AKA the never movers, folks who may be incredibly talented, um, but for myriad reasons, don't find themselves trying to earn a living from music. They are folks who have day jobs that they love, who perform on the side, um, who are, you know, an active part of our music ecosystem, but are not ever going to be trying to make a dedicated living just from music. And then there's the middle. Uh, 60%, the music middle class, uh, that 60% who are, of course, talented artists, players, songwriters, session musicians who build often uh, nationally renowned careers, but choose to live in the non-industry hub cities that they call home. You know, those people want what we all want. Uh, they want to figure out how to make a comfortable living. They want to figure out how to provide for their families uh, and themselves. And they want to do that doing not only what they love, but what they excel at, uh, which is music. So this is the group that I really want to focus in on today. When our city has a thriving music middle class, we all stand to benefit. Um, and that's true in a number of ways. So Tourism, of course, feels really obvious, right? This is one of the kind of principles that Music Export Memphis is really built on, that when our musicians tour, um, they represent our city. But I think that there's another layer to this, particularly in a city like Memphis that has such a strong music legacy, which is that these musicians also work our local tourism jobs. Um, here in Memphis, a couple of perfect examples of this are, uh, if you've ever visited here, our historic Sun Studio, which was, of course, the birthplace of rock and roll, um, where Elvis came in and cut his first record for his mom, uh, where, uh, you know, uh, Ike Turner came in and cut Rocket 88. Um, Sun Studio tour guides are all working musicians um, in Memphis. And Sun is also just a really great place for them to work because uh, it's daytime hours. They can still gig and play at night. Um, but that is that is a huge part of our tourism ecosystem that those musicians are supporting. It's something that uh, their very presence at Sun Studio is a big part of what makes people continue to want to come back there. Um, so there's so much wrapped up in each of these points, right, about the ways that 
having this thriving music middle class makes a difference in our city. So education, um, you know, when you have musician, working musicians in your city, obviously many of them are working as music educators, whether they're actually in classrooms doing, uh, you know, music lessons or working with youth engagement, working with seniors, they're, they are engaging and educating around music uh, to varying parts of our community in ways that are, are critically important. Uh, creative placemaking and cultural preservation. Again, for so many cities that have, uh, you know, a particular music related identity, um, however well known or not it may be. I was on a, a panel earlier this week with um, someone from Washington, D.C., where the official music is go-go. Um, I happen to love go-go music. Uh, it's phenomenal. Um, but obviously preserving that is an incredibly important part of the the identity of DC, preserving in Memphis our soul music, uh, our hip hop, you know, our rock and roll, our blues. Obviously, incredibly important part of our uh, preserving our culture uh, and carrying it forward into the future. Um, and of course, creative placemaking. I mean, I think this is a term that has become really buzzy, probably in the last few years. Uh, but if we just take it all down to brass tacks, you know, if we look at the power of a music festival, a simple street festival with live music to bring neighbors together to create social cohesion and connection amongst people in a community, uh, it's critically important for our fabric, right, which connects into then the next point, um, that, that social cohesion, that sense of belonging, that sense of connection, um, music is an incredible driver of that, and without working musicians in our community, those types of things don't happen, those types of engagements don't happen. And of course, importantly, economic vitality, right? We know that music is a driver for economies. Um, we also know that musicians are gonna invest back into small businesses. Musicians, particularly those who are, are touring, but even those who aren't, um, are going to buy t-shirts from a local vendor or printer. They're going to have posters made, um, paying a local artist or a local print company to create those. You know, there are all these moments where they are connecting into the larger, uh, particularly I think small business ecosystem in cities uh, in creating economic vitality. Um, that's, a, that's a point that I always feel I have to bring up and, and do like to bring up because the impact of music on, um, you know, again, the, the economics of a city is inarguable. But I think that I will confess what is difficult about being at a lot of the tables I find myself at um, and have found myself at over the years is that this argument has to come first um, for a lot of folks. So you really have to kind of know and understand the economic impact of music in your community to even kind of open the ears of some folks in leadership positions uh, in your city to get them to understand all of the rest of the things on this page and why they're so critical to, to our cities and, and to the health of our cities. So, I'm going to take a second and talk to you a little bit specifically about my organization, Music Export Memphis, and the work that we do, because what I've kind of built up here is really the ethos of our work. Um, and, you know, this is what I'm going to walk you through here is our change narrative, essentially our theory of change. You may have heard that phrase before, or as I often preface it, because I think it just makes it really, really clear to us, this is how change happens, what I'm about to walk you through. Um, and while our organization is unique, um, as far as I know, across the US, there are certainly music offices in all sorts of cities doing similar um, pieces of this work. But to my knowledge, there's not another 501c3 nonprofit that is doing what we do um, in another city. However, all of the things that you will see in this change narrative we believe are true, period. These are not things that are unique to Memphis. Um, this is how change happens, right? So first, of course, this is our mission statement, really, right? We create opportunities that subsidize working musicians, um, allowing them to tour, build audiences outside the city, and sustain their careers. So first and foremost, everything we do is centered around that idea of opportunity, Going back to one of the first things I said, you know, musicians, the music middle class, 
They only want what we all want. And we all want to live in cities that have opportunity for us. Um, so that has really been a central focus. How can we create more opportunity for musicians not only those who are already living in our city, but how can those opportunities become a magnet? Uh, and we'll, we'll get into more of that impact here in a second. Um, the subsidy is an important word here, and we're gonna come back to that a good bit um, in, this, in, in the, the later part of the presentation. But so this is the mission. This is the first thing that happens in this sort of change narrative is that we're creating these opportunities and we're subsidizing musicians to allow them to build those audiences and advance their career. So then what happens? Well, we believe that when that is true, Memphis becomes a city of choice for musicians and that there's a lot of things that happen as a result, right? And this connects back to uh, the, the conversation about what are the benefits of a music middle class in your city um, very directly, right? We know that when we are a city of choice for musicians, there's more vibrancy and enhanced quality of life for everyone, not just those in the music community or music ecosystem. We know that there is better and more abundant music engagement and education for young people. Uh, and I will pause for just a second to say, I, I like to be intentional about using that phrase music engagement alongside music education, because uh, there are some really fantastic organizations here in Memphis, and I know across the country, who are really using music as a tool with young people to create, uh, you know, freedom to create to sort of transform the way they uh, think about the opportunities that exist in their own life, the way that they interact with the world, the way that they navigate, um, you know, their their choices. It's much more than learning how to play an instrument, though that can sometimes be a piece of it. So that feels like an important piece to, to point out and, and something that uh, music engagement, I think, is an exciting area of music nonprofit work. Um, of course, as we talked about with the music middle class, preservation of our city's character, deeper community connection and empathy through culture. Uh, and last but definitely not least, we believe that when Memphis is a city of choice for musicians, essentially it's a city of choice for talented people of all stripes, that we become nationally competitive for talent, period, because musicians want to call Memphis home. So when all of that is true, here's what we believe happens that economic vibrancy is created uh, through investment in these artists, that that leads to investment in small businesses, as I mentioned before, that power the music ecosystem. In Memphis specifically, um, it's recording studios, it's record pressing, again, it's t-shirt printers, it's poster printers, it's graphic designers, it's all of those folks who have a tertiary connection to this music ecosystem. And so that economic vibrancy starts to come up and then finally, we also believe, and this is important, that the work that we do can raise the creative ceiling of our music ecosystem by offering artists pathways to build networks outside of our city and opportunities for international exchange. So this photo was taken in Liverpool, as you may have guessed, um, with, during an international exchange that, that we did uh, with the city of Liverpool in 2017, August of 2017, we had two uh, singer songwriters from Memphis and two singer songwriters from Liverpool alongside two mentors from each city. So the two mentors from Memphis are pictured in this photo, a talented songwriter and producer by the name of Susan Marshall. And then a gentleman you may know if you are a music fan, uh, and frankly, even if you don't recognize him, you probably know his music. Uh, his name is William Bell. Um, perhaps best known for his song, You Don't Miss Your Water, and a song made famous by Albert King, Born Under a Bad Sign. Uh, William Bell what, is a legendary um, Hall of Fame songwriter um, from Memphis who uh, cut records on the Stax label for years. So William Bell was one of our, uh, our mentors for this. But we had you know, the opportunity to spend a chunk of time in both cities collaborating making new music together, but also importantly, exploring the cities. And if you know even a little bit about Memphis and a little bit about Liverpool, there's really a tremendous uh, connection between the two in a number of ways that bring us discomfort, but are important to explore. And so we really had this opportunity again to, to push creatively uh, with the artists that took part in this program and importantly, as we think about those networks, the other thing that can happen with, through programs like this is that 
and, and certainly that we hope happens is that the artists will, you know, six months after a year after say, Hey, I'm ready to tour in that territory from that exchange, right? I'm ready to go back to the UK. And I know that I have relationships there now that I can call upon. I know that I have artists that I can ask if I can open for them or who can connect me to the venue infrastructure, to booking agents, whatever it might be, so that that territory is now an option for me to go and tour and expand my career even further. And with the access that we have now to data from services like Spotify, even from Facebook and Instagram to understand where your fan base is growing across the world, it's critical to be able to act on that data. And we hope that programs like this, again, not only raise the creative ceiling, but build those networks to advance careers for these artists. But of course, this is bigger than us, right? And, and I do think it's important just to go back to say that, you know, that that change narrative, um, how change happens, that's not specific to Memphis. Uh, you could you could insert the name of your city in there, and I believe those things would be true. If you if you build it, if you build opportunity, if you build the right types of programs to create, um, you know, to to push that creative ceiling, to build those networks your city will also experience the same benefits. Your city would also experience um, the benefits in economic vibrancy, the benefits in, uh, in talent attraction, in tourism, et cetera. So we've explored the music middle class now, uh, and we're gonna go to another middle, um, which is the intersection of music nonprofit and music industry. This actually, I have to just shout out. This uh, hip hop artist is Awfum, A-W-F-M. It stands for a weirdo from Memphis, um, incredibly talented. He's on all uh, DSPs, digital uh, streaming providers. Go and check him out. He's part of a label group called Unapologetic in Memphis that is amazingly prolific. Um, awesome, awesome artist. So, okay. The intersection of music industry and music nonprofit. So I'm guessing that you probably have a good understanding of either side of this Venn diagram. On the right, you understand music nonprofits, right? They might be a, a symphony or an opera, or they might be a music education organization or a music engagement organization for young people. They present public performances. Um, they offer classes and workshops. Maybe they do music therapy. Um, they use music as a tool to build community and neighborhoods. Those activities you probably feel as, as I do um, are vital to our cultural fabric. Uh, they're also not necessarily able to self-sustain uh, through earned revenue. And so they're very often funded by philanthropy. Foundations, individuals, uh, local and uh, federal government grants fund those organizations and allow that work to continue in our communities. So on the left, music industry, um, even if you're only a casual fan, you probably also bring some understanding of what the music industry looks like uh, to this, right? You understand that artists are making records, they sell them, hopefully, they tour, uh, they make merchandise, you know, the t-shirts, the koozies, the stickers, uh, maybe they're lucky enough to do, to have endorsements, maybe they're lucky enough to uh, place their music in television or film to sync their music um, and to make money that way. And, and ultimately that those artists and bands within that music industry, just like the labels are small businesses, that this is a business ecosystem, a for-profit ecosystem. And so those artists are, or bands, um, are for-profit entities. And the idea is that they are able to make a living through those diverse revenue streams that we just talked about. But this is where I want to show you around today, is <laughs> the middle, right? Another middle. Um, both what's possible there at this intersection and also I think what's probable in our cities if we ignore this, um, if we ignore what sits at the center of this. Um, so let's start by pulling back again and, and looking at each side of this diagram. So a musician is an entrepreneur. They're a small business, right? Um, many of them to, to kind of drill down and, and get more specific, 
Many of them are sole proprietor LLCs, um, or maybe they're partnerships if they're a band. Uh, they may even have business licenses in their local community. They certainly pay taxes on the income that they earn, right? They are businesses looking to develop diverse revenue streams. Meanwhile, on the other side of that diagram, uh, we have philanthropy. Um, philanthropy in the US supports a nonprofit infrastructure. Um, sometimes we call them uh, SOBs, um, symphony, opera, ballet, right? Um, but it's also theaters, it's museums, it's cultural institutions that are registered 501c3 nonprofit organizations and eligible to receive tax deductible contributions. Um, and, and I think I, what's very important as we kind of move into this next part of the talk to, to for me to say out loud is that, you know, these organizations are doing critically important work. They're doing social good. Um, they're meeting critical needs in our communities. You know, they're delivering art uh, and, and preserving culture, just as we talked about earlier. But the argument that I want to make is that our musicians are doing all of those things as well. Uh, and they're participating in an economy that as of right now is not designed uh, to allow them to make a living wage. So we'll pause there on this journey for a moment. And, and I will say we do need to fix what's broken. This was, these are just a few headlines. Uh, that I pulled out. And if you are engaged at all um, in the music industry or in this space, interested in these topics, you know that the conversation about um, royalties from streaming has been ongoing for years uh, since the beginning of, you know, the launch of services like Spotify. So, you know, do we need to correct some of these issues in the industry? Undoubtedly, of course we do. Um, publishing royalty structure, streaming compens compensation models. But, you know, for, for me, right, that's a conversation for another day. And, and one of the reasons that I say that is because this is a very, very big old ship that has been trying to turn around for a while. Um, I was using that metaphor for the music industry in talks I gave I, that I, I can recall as long as six or seven years ago, um, you know, the music industry is still trying to figure out what this next iteration looks like. And meanwhile, our creators are advocating and working to, to try to fix what's broken. And luckily we do have organizations on the national level that are, that are trying to do that work. But to me, philanthropy has an opportunity to lead, to set the tone for fixing some of those broken elements fair pay for artists uh, and for creative works. And where I see opportunity is in that social and civic good that our musicians bring to our cities. And a model exists for philanthropy to learn from, right? Uh, essentially, we need to fix all that, but we can't afford to wait. Um, philanthropy has an opportunity to lead, to set the tone um, for, for, for doing this work. Um, in a way that I hope will impact not just the industry, but also our cities um, and how they approach the music middle class. So what is the future of music making in our non-industry hub cities? So I want to I want to start with what does that mean, a non-industry hub city? And, and I will tell you a little story. First, I will shout out, this band is called Life Explicit. Um, they uh, were performing here in St. Louis at a pop-up event that we did um, in a park downtown in 2019. We brought a bunch of Memphis bands and just sort of took over and threw a Memphis day party in St. Louis as a little, as a little surprise um, for the folks in St. Louis. Um, so definitely check them out. They're a, a big band. They do sort of soul rock uh, fusion. Um, so when I first started exploring this work and kind of first became interested in, again, this intersection of music and cities, um, I had come from a, a brief 
career uh, or, or, or a brief stint in working at a music nonprofit uh, that was, it's unfortunately now defunct in Memphis, um, that was actually an economic development nonprofit, which a lot of people didn't know. We were called the Memphis Music Foundation. And our mission was to empower musicians to make money from their music. And it, and it was a critical stop in my journey because it is where I really um, sort of drank the Kool-Aid for lack of a, of a, a better, a better metaphor. Um, I really just got hooked on this idea that music could be a driver for our city and, and really understanding all of those other pieces, right. Of what a music middle-class brings, uh, to a city. And, and I think that that's really when I became hooked on this work early on, but there were two things that sort of haunted us in our work. Um, one of them was that there was a constant tension, or so it seemed, between the legacy music history in our city and the contemporary music scene. And a feeling that many artists had that, um, you know, they were being overlooked or that the contemporary scene wasn't being celebrated because we as a city were so focused on promoting our past, um, that it was about getting folks to come to Graceland, that it was about uh, getting folks to come to Beale Street and maybe listen to, you know, a, a working musician who is certainly alive, very much alive, um, perform, but performing the music of, you know, long dead bluesmen, that we were really focused on this legacy and this history and that we were doing that at the expense of our contemporary musicians. And, and that was the tension uh, that certainly you, you heard about, right? That you perceived from conversations uh, among musicians to be true. And the second piece that I heard constantly was that Memphis was not gonna be able to move forward because we were not an industry hub city. That this was such a tremendous issue in the development of our music scene, you know, in the sort of redevelopment of our music scene, because to give you kind of a brief look back, you know, Memphis had a thriving music industry in the 60s and 70s. It was one of the city's top three employers, um, uh, particularly because of the activity that was happening at places like Stax Records. Um, and, you know, once a, a series of events that, again, is a whole other lecture for another day, um, a series of events led to, uh, you know, just a sort of talent flight from Memphis to Nashville um, and a series of unfortunate, you know, business decisions and uh, just a series of unfortunate events led to uh, the slow sort of dissolution of our major music industry. Um, and, and everyone seemed fixed on that, despite the fact that it was the early 2000s and that, you know, what they were talking about, that sort of, you know, music industry cluster um, had been there 30, 40 years ago. Uh, but these were the two things, right? Well, we won't be able to move forward because we're too focused on our legacy and we won't be able to move forward because we're not an industry hub city. So 2015, I attended the first uh, event that I ever got plugged into that really explored all of this stuff. It was a Music Cities convention um, that was hosted by my, who later became uh, one of my uh, clients, Sound Diplomacy. Um, and at that, at that day long, very dense, I mean, you know, like 8 a.m. to 7 p.m., panel after panel after panel, it got to be about three or four o'clock in the afternoon. And I realized that no one was talking about either of these things. No one was talking about a tension between legacy and contemporary, and no one was talking about whether or not they were an industry hub city. Um, what, you know, I, I think that the first one for me, it was a realization that this was just a red herring that was keeping us from just digging in and focusing on the assets that we had and the opportunity that we had to build on those to, you know, look at the future facing identity of our, of our music city. Um, but the second one I want to dig in on because it's important, right? Non-industry hub cities. So that's just everywhere, right? Like this is such an important point, I think, for a lot of people uh, to recognize. So oh, I'll give you LA, Nashville, Atlanta. Please do not, um, you know, pick apart my exact geolocating of these cities. It was definitely a ballpark. Uh, and, and New York, right? And and I could have probably, uh, I could have probably included Miami as well. There's an argument for Seattle. 
even if we put a couple of more of those cities in there, the point remains. Um, look at the rest of the map, right? We have cities across our country that also have a phenomenal music legacy or are doing important innovative work to invest in their music community to make their cities a city of choice for musicians um, they're investing in their venue infrastructure or they are working to make sure that their artists have fair pay you know they're taking those steps to really be a music city and they're not an industry hub city so i think that that stepping away from that you know, that sort of feeling that, well, we're not a music city or it's less important here because um, we have to recognize that most cities in the U.S. don't have that dense clustering of news, traditional music industry infrastructure. And that is, to me, all the more reason to figure out how to do this work and do it well. So, you know, I really believe that leaving so-called for-profit music business completely out of the philanthropic equation indicates a fundamental misunderstanding, first of all, of the modern music industry, as we've sort of talked about a little today, um, of the revenue streams available to music makers, and importantly, of that almost immeasurable impact that the, the music middle class has on our cities and communities. So to me, the future is subsidizing professional musicians. So I mentioned this word early on, and I, I promised that we would come back to it. Um, you know, if we want our cities to benefit from having rich music and culture, we have to figure out how to subsidize it. Um, we cannot wait for the industry to write itself. Again, it is a big, massive old ship that has been trying to figure out how to turn around for years. And I I want it to, we need it to, we desperately need it to, but that doesn't have to stop us from acting now. And again, philanthropy has an opportunity because it can be more nimble, because it can act quickly, because it's a much smaller boat to turn. Um, there is an opportunity here to do things differently and to set a precedent for how we move forward and how we invest again in that music middle class in our cities. Now, why focus just on music? Um, well, that's me. That's the conversation we're having, right? That's what I do. It's my it's my whole world. Um, but also, I would say I think it's a very unique space, um, especially commercial music that really makes it ripe for this type of innovative approach and thinking, right? Um, of course, I have to call out uh, the band. So this band is Those Pretty Wrongs. Uh, they were performing at our Americana Fest showcase back in uh, 2019. Um, and on the left there, if you are a power pop fan at all, that is Jody Stevens, who was the drummer in the band Big Star and is now the last living member of the band. But this is his new project. Um, and they, yeah, super super talented uh, and amazing that someone uh, so connected to our fantastic music legacy is still making new music in our city. It's one of the unique things about being in Memphis that I really love and I'm super proud of. Um, okay, so going back to that Venn diagram, right? We have this understanding that these folks are small businesses. Uh, they need to make it to make a living, right? We accept that capitalism decides in the music industry. Um, Meanwhile, we do not accept that with other art forms, right? This is why I think that commercial music is such an interesting space to play in, um, besides the fact that, that it's the thing I care about most, but it's an interesting space to play in because of this. You know, with um, other art forms, you know, the theater, you know, we believe that it should receive grants um, and fundings. Uh, we believe that we should donate to the symphony. Um, you know, we believe that those institutions are such a critical part of our culture uh, that supporting them so that they can be sustainable is important to the, you know, the, the health of our community um, as a whole. And that's the reason why music requires a fundamental shift in the way that we approach it, because the reality is this is about culture in our cities. It's not just about uh, the music industry and whether or not you can make it. Um, and to pause again for another small rant, um, I do always think, you know, it's interesting. There is certainly a counterpoint or a point of view that says, why should we subsidize a musician who can't make it on their own? Um, 
And, and certainly by this point in the talk, we've recognized the issues that are, you know, inherent and insidious throughout the, the current music industry um, and, and certainly within the, the streaming ecosystem, the issues that exist uh, and the challenges, you know, even on a moderately successful release, an artist is making small change off of those streams and most people are choosing the access over ownership model rather than owning a small amount of music, they are choosing to access a large amount of music. It makes a lot of sense from a consumer standpoint, but it's very, very challenging from an artist standpoint. And, and beyond that, you know, another um, B that is consistently in my bonnet is that the per gig wages for live performance for most musicians largely have not changed in the past 20 to 30 years. An artist or a musician who is getting $150 for a gig now was probably getting $150 for that gig in 1990. Uh, and when we look at spending of power across that same time period, and we look at inflation across that same time period, we know that that's not the same. Uh, those numbers should be inching up just like you would expect that your salary would increase over time to adjust for cost of living at your job, at your full time nine to five. But that hasn't happened. And as a result, the spending power of our musicians has decreased uh, significantly. Um, so, you know, I think that whenever anyone, or if ever, and most people have learned not to have this argument with me by now, um, but if ever anyone counters with, you know, why should we be supporting an artist who can't make it on their own? Um, it's, you know, it's an easy argument for me. It doesn't have so much to do, if anything to do with their talent or their hustle. And it has a lot to do with the ways that the music economy is still fundamentally not one in which uh, or not one that is designed to allow you to make a middle class living. Now you can you can find one. People do all the time, um, but there are plenty who don't. And to me, that's the problem. And it's about culture, right? It's about the preserving the overall culture in our cities. So here is what I believe needs to happen. So if philanthropy only knows how to give to 501c3 nonprofits, if philanthropy is to be to be bold and a little and a little salty, um, if philanthropy is driven by rich folks who want tax shelters, um, then let's build organizations that re-grant. This is important. Um, of course, I believe that every city needs a music export Memphis. Uh, or a universal basic income. I would, I would also take that. Uh, my, my bleeding heart would take that for all of us. Um, but, but the reality is it doesn't have to look exactly like our work. You know, certainly um, we have built a model that is, that is replicable, um, but it has to be an organization that can re-grant. And I'll pause here for a minute and explore this term of re-grant. So what that means is that Music Export Memphis is a 501c3 nonprofit who accepts money from philanthropic organizations. Uh, we have local foundation funders who support us. We certainly have um, a, a huge group of individual donors who support us generously and are able to write their gifts off on their taxes. Uh, we apply for and receive grant funding, all of those typical things you would expect back from that philanthropic structure. Uh, but we are, in most cases, regranting probably about 90% of those funds right back out into the community to individuals. So one thing that we experienced in the past year in 2020 is that when some of the government relief dollars started to show up, uh, there was a lot of hesitation around regranting, And we started to see this word popping up in, uh, in some of the you know, language around the CARES Act funding uh, and some of the language around, uh, you know, grants that were going to come through the cities through that. And could, the, could that money be regranted? And what does that look like? And could that money go to individuals? And what I found, though I will say, to share the, the happy end of the story first, we did end up, Music Export Memphis, getting a significant contribution from the city of Memphis through CARES funding um, of, of $100,000 that we distributed through our COVID relief fund. One of the uh, benefits for our community of having an organization like Music Export Memphis that was in fact 
already set up to re-grant and do so to individuals, uh, is that when COVID hit in March, we were able to very quickly pivot to fundraising for Relief Fund uh, and to get that money out the door quickly to our individuals because we, again, we were already set up to do it. We had been granting to individuals for almost five years. And so it was an easy shift for us to make, which was critically important in our community to be able to get that relief out the door quickly. Um, to go back, there is a there is a there is a little bit of dissonance around this idea of granting to individuals. Um, and you did start to see language come up in some of these federal guidelines. Um, and, and certainly I don't, I couldn't speak to the situation in other cities, but I know that here in Memphis, um, the, the, the money sort of came through and, and they said, okay, here's the relief you're gonna get. And then it was made clear that there were gonna be some very specific rules about how this money can be distributed. And not only that, if you distributed it uh, incorrectly or not in, not in accordance with those rules, you may have to pay it back. Uh, and that caused a lot of distress uh, in terms of the governance of those funds, understandably so, and how they could get out the door and, and really delayed things. But one of the things that again, came up very often was the, the sort of, uh, legality is not the right word, but this sort of, you know, whether or not it was within the scope of the rules for us to grant to individuals. And even as I went out and pursued other opportunities that existed specific to COVID. Um, so as I was pursuing uh, grants for Music Export Memphis through other emergency funds at the state level and here at the local level um, through our philanthropic community, we were rejected at least three times that I can think of. Uh, and, and the primary reason was because we were not taking that money and running a program. We weren't taking that money and, and maybe distributing food or doing something else that was obviously um, desperately needed in our community, but we wanted to take that money and give it to our musicians. Um, and that sort of direct, you know, re-grant to individuals was not something that was supported. Um, philanthropy wanted to support programs and we wanted to support people directly. And it was something that really kind of became a challenge. So what I believe needs to happen is that we have got to actively work against that. We have to build organizations in our cities that are designed to grant to, individual, to individuals. Um, organizations that are, are ready as a 501c3 to accept those funds and re-grant them as subsidy to sustain our musicians. Um, you know, obviously I wish that every city in America would redirect a percentage of its hotel occupancy tax to fund grassroots and individual artists. I wish that cities were all doing um, an admissions tax like, or an admissions fee, I think it's called, um, the way that Seattle does uh, to fund an office of arts and culture, to fund work specifically designed to keep artists in the city. I absolutely wish that. Um, but again, in the absence of that, there is a much smaller boat that can turn around quickly and that's philanthropy. So, you know, the, the reality is the, the work of, of creating those structures in cities through government could take years. Um, it doesn't make it any less important, but, uh, you know, it could take a ballot measure. It could take the ending of, you know, sometimes decades long contracts. Uh, it could take lobbying and philanthropy can jump in now. Philanthropy can change its approach now. Uh, and ultimately, as I mentioned earlier, I really hope that philanthropy can sort of show the way for cities for how we can invest in the future. Here's what we figured out how to do. Here's the model that we built. Now, here you go, cities take it and institutionalize it. Because after all, what is at stake? You know, it is the future of music making in our cities. It's the immense value that it brings uh, well beyond economics, the social, the cultural, the historic, um, the community building value. Because to me, ultimately this is all about choice. In my work at Music Export Memphis, uh, I talk a lot about choice. And mostly when I'm talking about those choices, I'm sharing with our supporters that we want Memphis to be a city of choice for musicians. You know, we want to create opportunities, as I mentioned earlier, that make them choose Memphis over any other city. Um, but the reality is that there is another choice involved here, and that is the choice to remain working as a musician or not. Um, and if we don't find ways to subsidize our culture bearers now in the future, I am afraid that for many of them, that will not be a choice at all. Um, so ultimately, subsidy 
is the way that I believe we should consider and approach this. Farming is the best analogy and the one that I use most often. We all, uh, certainly I hope, understand the necessity, the, the very uh, critical nature of farming to our health and well being. We need food to put on our tables. We need American farmers to be sustainable so that they can continue to produce crops uh, that feeds our communities. This is very obvious. And we also know that sometimes external forces will dictate that they are not sustainable, that they have a season that is dry, that they have a season that does not produce. Um, and we are happy that there are structures in place that can subsidize them and that can safeguard them from completely going out of business uh, because of one dry season. And to me, music is as critical, uh, it's as critical in my life, certainly as, as the food that I eat. Um, and I believe that it's critical enough in our communities that this is the way that we should approach it, that we understand that ideally, our musicians are for-profit businesses, that they're bringing in money through diverse revenue streams that supports themselves and their families, that they're in the black. But we also recognize that sometimes that may not be true. Um, and so we build in systems that can subsidize them. Some examples from our work at Music Export Memphis include tour grants. So providing an amount of money that is not designed to pay 100% of costs, but it is again designed to subsidize. Um, it's designed to cover enough costs that a tour can become profitable. Our merch fund is designed, again, not to cover 100% of costs, to cover enough cost that your margin on the sale of that merch is much higher so that you can invest that back into your business so that you can invest it back into our community. And our merch fund, in fact, requires that artists invest uh, the funds that they are granted directly with a Memphis-based small business um, so that we can create some of that cyclical impact. But everything that we do is subsidizing an activity that our musicians were already going to do. And of course, we believe an activity that fundamentally held benefit for our city from the internal ways that we've discussed, but importantly, because when they are on the road, they are representing Memphis and they are selling our city better than any brochure, any website, any you know piece of information, any pamphlet ever could. Uh, and we want to recognize that, honor that, and, and ordain them. And the way to do that, again, we feel, is through subsidy. Um, because we know that the music middle class is at stake and we want to make sure that uh, that choice that perhaps isn't a choice at all um, doesn't have to be made by any musician in our community going forward. And with that, I will stop my, my screen share here uh, and see if there are, take a sip of water and see if there are any questions. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. That was incredible uh, and a lot to take in. We definitely will kind of open up the Q&A and the chat. I so appreciate your knowledge and your experiences and the work that you're doing in your community. And for us to have this national dialogue is really amazing. Um, I know I have lots of questions, uh, but I'm really excited to hear what our um, folks have. So we've got from uh, Dr. Tiffany Bourgeois is asking um, here, she, she says, thank you so much for your talk. You highlighted international exchange and international experiences. How do international philanthropic structure differ from the United States structure and how might that impact the ability to support and subsidize musicians? This is a great question. Um, so, you know, I, first I'll say that when I started Music Export Memphis, I was inspired by international music export offices and, and sometimes international sort of cultural export offices. It's often uh, bigger than just music. But when you look at countries like Canada, France, the UK, Germany, um, they all have these offices that are dedicated to creating opportunities for those artists outside of the territory. Um, and I really felt that that was a scalable concept. And so that was a driving force for me in building Music Export Memphis. But the important missing piece is that those agencies are all support supported tremendously through tax dollars, um, essentially, right? They are part of government budgets. Um, and when we planned the exchange uh, with Liverpool, that 
was, you know, we, we sort of, we try to build these exchanges with a 50-50 funding model so that we're bringing 50% and our, and our partners bringing 50%. Uh, and that the 50% on the UK side was 100% supported by Arts Council England, um, which is a granting agency that uh, funnels lottery dollars in the UK to, uh, to support the arts. And I think that what, what feels really important to highlight is that it is, to me, it isn't just about the existing uh, kind of structures for driving revenue to the arts in these other countries though they are robust and will make you sad um, if you're an American to, to dive into that research even a little. Um, it's about the attitude to me overall that that when, you know, particularly when I've traveled to Canada too, which I've, Canada and the UK are the two countries I've had the most opportunity to be in who have these types of structures. And the sort of the attitude from even the average person about the, the critical nature of art. And there's, there's no feeling, um, there's only shock that the United States doesn't fund arts the way that their country does. There's no feeling from them that it's an inappropriate use of tax dollars or that it's an inappropriate use of, you know, that lottery revenue or whatever it might be. Um, the attitude is very clear that that the arts are critical. Um, and I'm sure that for folks who live in those countries, they can find all sorts of reasons, you know, to, to, to pick that, that this or that is not perfect, but certainly from where we're sitting in the U.S., it's hard not to feel jealous of what some of these other countries have. Um, I think that a couple of things to me feel really true. One is that we need to continue to lobby for, um, frankly, a national office of culture, uh, a culture ministry, essentially. Um, two, we need to look for ways to build the, this types of infrastructure on a scaled down level in our own communities to sort of make up for that gap. Um, and, Three, we need to learn as much as we can from what's happening in these other countries. So a, a perfect example is there is an organization called Factor in Canada that does some fantastic work um, with the music industry. And I have spent a lot of time on their website and looking at their programs and just trying to absorb everything that I can um, to learn how we can do our work better, uh, where they may have figured something out that we can emulate. Um, I am a big believer in not reinventing the wheel, especially when it comes to this work and, and someone out there has figured out a way and we want to, to build on that. Um, so we're actually in the process right now of building some, uh, artist profiles and data modeling into our work that really was inspired by research that we did on Factor. So I think that um, we've got a lobby for more in the US, but in the meantime, we have to look for opportunities to do it ourselves and we have to learn as much as we can from the international community. Yes. <laughs> um, sorry, I, I, again, I wanna just reiterate to everybody if you would like to, um, you know, have your video on or anything like that, please do feel free to put that in the Q&A. We've got a, a few more questions. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read those out loud. And thank you for those wise words. That is something that I think is a constant conversation that we need to be pushing for. Um, Cardia Pitts asks this question is, is there anything local independent artists or consumers can do in order to advocate for the creation of a music export office in their own cities? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, certainly I think that it's important to let your leaders know what's important to you. Um, you are a voter. Uh, in, in some rooms, first and foremost, you are a voter, right? And you are someone who um, has a voice in the process uh, that puts your leaders where they are. And I think that, um, you know, again, I, I, I mentioned a conversation I was in earlier this week with a colleague from DC. And, and one the, the sort of focus of that talk was really on what makes a music city. And something that came up time and again was that um, there's all sorts, to me, there's all sorts of paths to that designation. But one thing that rings true across is that there has to be someone um, in a high level of leadership in your city, whether that's in city hall or maybe a chamber of commerce, who really believes that, you know, music is critically important um, and it's going to be that kind of flag bearer and advocate to drive those initiatives forward. But ultimately, you can create that by letting your leaders know that it is important to you. Um, so I think that uh, making your voice heard and certainly organizing is incredibly important to simply start with 
music is important to us as in, as consumers, as music fans, um, as citizens and voters. And we wanna make sure that our city is prioritizing that one. But two, I would look around in your ecosystem for organizations that may be doing work adjacent um, to this that, that would sort of make sense for them to add it to their repertoire. We have been really intentional from day one about having a laser focus on our mission, because one of the things that I learned um, and I'm, that I think anyone would learn in any amount of time spent in nonprofit is that scope creep or sort of mission creep and, and you know building on a project or taking a project because it's connected to a grant or because a funder asked you to that doesn't really sit within your mission. Um, it's, a, it's a perfect way to start towards disaster, um, frankly. And so it's been something that's been so important to me to stay laser focused. That being said, our programs pulled out can make sense in lots of different places. And so one example I would give you is your tourism office would be a great place to start. Um, our tourism office has been a partner to us since uh, we founded in 2016. Tourism offices are interested in this types of work, right? They're interested in um, promoting the city. And so they may be interested in owning an ambassador program, which is what we do that provides tour support. Um, so that could be a place to start. The other place to start could be entities who are interested in town attraction, because this work obviously has a big impact on the ability of your city to be a magnet for talent. Uh, and so I think finding those folks who have an interest in the impact and lobbying to them, as well as lobbying to your elected leaders, uh, will, will be the best course of action to get that conversation started. Thank you. I'm gonna move us towards the next question there. Cardia says thank you, so does Dr. Bourgeois. Uh, we've got one from Michelle Adias. Dr. Michelle Adias, we've got, uh, my question surrounds gentrification and music venues. Here in Columbus, there have been extensive changes in the last 20 years. It used to be cheap to live here and now the cost of living has pushed many artists out. Many of the smaller music venues here in town have closed, which used to provide more opportunity for lesser known artists to perform. I suspect that uh, other cities are also experiencing this. What can we do to address it? Mm, the million dollar question. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, I actually spoke on a panel at South by Southwest several years ago where someone from Austin um, asked a similar question, but it was very specific to Austin. And, and I sort of said, you know, I think that I think the ship has sailed. I think the horse has left the stable. Um, but what's important is that for those cities that are that are not in that position, that are starting to see growth. Um, and frankly, I feel that this is really relevant for me here in Memphis. Um, you know, it's important that we start to put protections in place now. So there are examples. There, there are uh, models for this in cities around the country. You know, the first one, first and foremost, how can we protect our venues so that they are not um, pushed out by some of the usual suspects? So number one would be uh, residential development um, that either pushes them out because of no protection or outdated um, regulation around sound and noise. Uh, you know, and there's a there's a great model for how that can be alleviated called agent of change principle, which states that you know, whoever is the agent of change. So if there is an existing cluster of venues, then that that condo development would be the change agent and they would be responsible for sound mitigation. So again, there's some models out there for that type of work, but I think that it requires the foresight. It requires leaders who are who are concerned with making sure that those venues can still thrive. Um, something that really connects to the talk today that, it, that I have been thinking a lot about lately is our venues as for-profit businesses that also need a different approach to protection and preservation from our cities. Um, they are not like other for-profit businesses because they are the, the, the cradle in some ways of our, our music ecosystems. They are the space, uh, the creative space. And, and to your point, the space where, where independent artists and emerging artists are getting discovered. They're so important to our social fabric and we've got to find ways to protect them. 
Um, so, you know, whether it's creating a, a historic or a cultural district around a clustering of venues or just building into policy to protect those spaces and places, I think that's one important element. And then I think the other element to your point in your question is looking at how we protect housing opportunities for artists. Uh, you, you do see, again, philanthropy shows up and figures out a way, you see organizations like ArtSpace uh, that have figured out how to uh, leverage the existing structure uh, to leverage affordable housing credits to be able to create spaces for artists that are, uh, you know, that have controlled uh, rent um, and have a certain amount that are available to, um, you know, to, they have, actually, I think they have, um, income requirements across the board to be able to to access the space so to, as a as a resident to be able to apply to be a resident so art space again you know a nonprofit organization is figuring out how to create this protected housing for artists but you know cities can do that um and 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 i think that it's about it's about having those conversations now. It's about seeing the writing on the wall and finding ways to put the protections in place, even when some folks might be saying, we don't have a problem yet. And I think that connects to where I feel like we are in Memphis right now. I would not say that we have a problem with gentrification by the letter of the law. Um, folks are not being displaced, right? And so I think that we have a lot of development um, and we have a lot of property values going up, but we still have a lot of affordable housing. We still have, you know, our, our communities are still able to, uh, our artists are still able to access housing in, in their community. Um, but the writing is on the wall again and it's important that we put the the protections in place now so that five six seven years from now we're not going oh no we have a problem how do we fix it because it's definitely too late she has a follow-up there um are there any cities that have created 501c3 for combined smaller performance spaces combined with affordable housing um you have my brain thinking in new directions thank you uh, so, sorry, I'm just trying to see where that is so I can look at... Yeah, it's in the chat. Um, so if you can see that, it's... Oh, okay. Got it, got it. Because I want to read through that. Okay. Smaller performance spaces combined with affordable housing. Um, yeah. So I think it's not, it's not necessarily strictly a performance space, but I think the best example that I would give you to look into would be the partnership between um, Denver's housing office, whatever it may be called, uh, ours is called Housing and Community Development, and uh, an organization called Youth on Record. Um, they had a really innovative partnership in the redevelopment of some affordable housing units um, in Denver that resulted in recording studio space, rehearsal space, and I believe also a sort of like amphitheater performance space. Don't quote me on that, um, but, but it's a really, really cool partnership that created opportunities for young people to make music uh, in connection with Youth on Record through the space that was built into their community. Um, but also the, you know, of course, when there's a performance space, we know the benefits with social connection are immense, right? Our community is, uh, you know, so much more connected. Our community is safer because we know our neighbors and we're looking out for them. We know who belong, you know, who belongs and doesn't belong. Um, and we're, we are a stronger community as a result of that. So um, I think, I think Youth on Record and in Denver would be a really, really great uh, place to start. Great, thank you. And I don't know, hopefully, um, Michelle, if you can see it too, it also says, uh, Dr. Skaggs in Nashville has uh, the Ryman Lofts Artist Public Housing um, and it's publicly owned music venues. They're not technically attached so, to the housing. That's cool. I'm gonna have to look into that. I'm not familiar with that. Yeah. Thank you. I love this collective brainstorming. <laughs> uh, we have a question from Dr. Skaggs also that's here in the chat. So I'm going to go ahead and read that one. It says, given the efforts of Music F Export Memphis, has there been a difference in relationships and community building among musicians, for example, mentoring or collaborations? Oh, wow. Um, so I think that our, uh, I think our scene is really collaborative, period. Um, but one thing that we have done uh, that I think 
has been really awesome. Um, and I'm really excited that we're going to be able to do it again this year. So of course, we're we're totally export focused, as, as I've made abundantly clear. And one of the struggles that we have just as a, you know, running a nonprofit is getting people who um, love music, but are not connected to the industry at all, to understand what we do and why it matters here, even though every program that we run is about getting our musicians an opportunity somewhere else. Um, and so, you know, we have literally one event that we do in Memphis every year and it's our fundraiser. Um, and we we're really careful about that because again, that mission, our mission is so export focused that we really feel like, okay, we need to raise money, but, but we're doing this one time so that we don't confuse our, our community about who we are and what we do. And so we thought, okay, we have one opportunity to do something in and for Memphians, how are we going to use this to raise the creative ceiling of our community? And so we actually built an event that is designed around artist collaboration. So what we do each year is we, you know, brainstorm and make a big list of artists, certainly many or most or all of whom have benefited from our work in some way. And with the work that we did in, on the COVID relief fund in the last year, which sent uh, relief dollars out to more than 450 musicians or industry professionals in our city, there aren't many folks that we haven't touched in some way, but we kind of do some pairings. We do some really unusual like genre pairings. We pair people who've never worked together before and we ask them to collaborate on new work um, first and foremost. And some of, in fact, actually, I think all of them tend to do that. They tend to collaborate on a new work. We also make it, you know, an option if you want to do a cover song together or something like that. That also counts as new work. But what's been amazing is, is all of the ones who choose to write together um, and collaborate together. And what we've learned and heard from them is that those relationships that they build through that pairing have continued, um, that they're touring with artists that they met uh, and worked with for the first time at that event, that they're, uh, that they're making more music together and that it never would have happened otherwise. So um, we, we have found a way to kind of do that. But I, but I do also think that um, um, the nature of, you know, of what we do is building some connection in our community. And the example I would give is that we have social media requirements for all of our ambassadors. They have to do a certain amount of posts about, um, really, we just ask them to write about what does it mean to you to represent Memphis when you're on the road? Um, and, but they, of course, they tag us and they shout us out. They're so grateful to get that grant funding. And so then you find, you know, artists are following artists and then they're sort of saying, hey, what's going on with that? I want to know more about Music Export Memphis. And so our artists then are spreading the word to each other to make sure that they all know about the opportunity. And I tend to think that that, that in and of itself is, is kind of building more community because they're looking out for each other. And, and I love that, you know, I want, I want to give away money until the pie is empty. So um, we love to see the artists that we funded kind of do, being our messenger and making sure that other folks in the community are aware of what they can apply for. And I see a follow up here in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, how does Mem choose who to fund? Is an artist or band ever too green or inexperienced to participate versus uh, is an artist or band ever too established to participate? Okay, great question. Um, so we uh, have for our ambassador program, which does tour grants, we have a small set of requirements and then we have a rubric system that decides funding. So the set of requirements in order to even be considered for a grant are that you have to have five or more dates booked outside the city and they have to be, uh, the majority have to be outside of a 150 mile radius. We're really uniquely situated in a tri-state. Um, and so we put this requirement in place because you could hit three states um, with, you know, a 30 minute drive to each gig. And, and we want to make sure that the artists are really pushing out further. So, um, so it's five dates minimum, 150 mile radius. Uh, Am I for, oh, well, and then of course you have to meet the requirements that any of our artists have to meet, which is that you have to have permanent residence in Memphis. So um, we have, you know, some brief things there, but the, the 150 miles and five dates is it on ambassadors. And if you meet those requirements, you will get money from us. Um, it's just a question of how much. And so that's where our tiered system comes in. So we're going to grant to artists based on a number of factors, um, based on the size of the band, based on, are you going all the way to the West coast or are you just touring in the South? You know, what's your geographic distance that you're covering. Um, 
And certainly we're going to look at, you know, are you, are you really ready to make the most of this? You know, how, how are you managing your social media? What does your online presence look like? Um, that can often be a factor that, that actually can unlock more money because we want to help those artists who maybe on the brink kind of push over uh, to something big. So I think that in, you're never too big, right, to participate in our model. I mean, for one thing, um, I think that what we know is that even those artists who appear to be very successful are still participating in this very broken music economy. And that's something that, you know, we're really aware of. But what we also know is that for some of our programs, you self-select in. And so some of those artists who are really established, they're not self-selecting in to the ambassador grant. They're not reaching out to us to get $750 for their tour because they're okay. They, they are touring in the Black. Um, they are making, you know, they're making profit from that tour. But where we might see them is at one of our experiences. This is another one of our programs. It's essentially anything that we do where we go to another city and produce something top to bottom. Uh, so that St. Louis event I mentioned is one of those. When we go to Americana Fest, when we go to South by Southwest and produce a party, that's that's an experience. Um, and very often that's where we, we pull in our established artists because what we're trying to do is create some magic sauce basically where we've got a headliner who is more established um, and is really going to draw folks in. And then we're going to build that bill out with some of our emerging artists who have submitted for the showcase and hopefully leverage that more established artist who is still going to be paid the same stipend as everybody else and still receive those benefits of being a part of the program. Um, but hopefully we're kind of, you know, leveraging their audience to get more exposure for the emerging folks. So I think that um, any artist who is is meeting those requirements is going to, um, regardless of their experience level, is going to get some funding from us. And the reality is that five tour dates, it, it weeds those folks out who are too green. Um, it takes a good bit of, you, you've got to really be pretty developed in your career to be able to get five dates on the calendar. Um, and we are working right now to introduce a new program in the next year called Ambassador Access, where we will be building some pathways for artists to take the leap into touring. Um, it requires a tremendous amount of financial risk, which is part of the reason why we even do the work we do. And we want more artists to be able to do it. We also recognize as we look across our programs that the Ambassador program, again, because you self-select in, is really white when we look across our demographics and it's really male. Um, whereas all of our other programs where we're curating a stage are so beautifully representative of all of the sounds of our city. We just know that some of those artists in some genres that the, the leap to touring is much harder. And so we're working on developing this access program now that will pair them with mentors, pair them with opening act gigs, pair them with booking resources, and also provide funding without that five date um, kind of barrier, but be a little bit more hands-on and helping them be export ready essentially. Thank you. Yes, every city does need a music export office. Fully agree. Get that model out there, right? <laughs> Are there other questions? Are there folks that would like to pop on? I know, thank you. You have been talking and like, it's amazing. It's amazing. I do have a question. I really love how you shared, um, you know, at the pandemic that your organization was able to pivot so quickly. I mean, the fact that you were already in a position to do that. Uh, do you know of other models or other, you know, cities that have been able to engage in that process? You know, I know in Columbus, they, um, you know, like the Columbus Arts Council does use that hotel tax and have, you know, they did pivot at that same kind of way for visual artists and, and artists in the city. So I'm just really curious of, you know, what are those other places that are like having these pockets of, of this happening and, and how do we kind of collaborate and collectively make that move forward? Yeah, I mean, I will give a big shout out to Springboard for the Arts, which I believe is in Minnesota. Um, they're, them and the record company or the record co, which is in Boston. So, uh, those, first of all, Springboard um, has a fantastic guide that you can just go on their website and download PDF guide for running um, emergency assistance funds. And I 
it was my Bible when we were preparing um, to launch our fund. And I got a lot from it, um, just in terms of, they really just broke down their process of, look, here's how we run it. Here's, here's literally a template email that we send. And here's our requirements to get, because they, they have run an ongoing emergency fund, which is also something that we are now looking at fundraising for and building as a result of this pandemic. So that, uh, you know, I mean, God forbid you have a house fire or you have a medical emergency or your gear gets stolen. Like there's a, there's a net for you. Um, you know, within our work, but the springboard for the arts guide was essential. And I know that they were doing a lot of individual granting through COVID as well. Um, and so I think I would point to their work as an excellent model for anyone that's interested in, in learning more about that. And then uh, my, uh, my friend, um, Matt at the record co in Boston, uh, he actually is the one who pointed me to springboards guide, first of all, because I sort of in, in the, you know, circles that I was in paying attention to, I saw that they were doing that the record co was doing, um, uh, a fund, a, you know, individual, uh, or, or emergency relief fund. And so I chatted with him about it. And from him kind of actually, we built on our, um, ability to get money out the door even faster because I learned about some tools that he was using for mass payments that we had not previously used. And so, I mean, getting, being connected to a network of nonprofits who are working with artists was absolutely essential for me early on in, in picking and learning from what they're doing. But I would, I would point to those two as great examples and springboard, I mean, big time as, as a really great example and an organization that clearly has just been so happy and willing to um, share what they do, which I think is phenomenal because none of us are in competition with each other, right? Um, and so we might as well share with each other what's what's working. Thank you. I'm gonna give everyone a minute. This was incredible. I am so grateful. Thank you so much for having me. Um, this is my favorite topic. So I, I really enjoyed the, the chance to talk with you all. It shines, it shines through. We <laughs> We're getting lots of thank yous and wonderful talk. With that, I do want to uh, thank everybody that has been on the call with us and has joined us in Zoom land on this Friday morning for this kind of like lunch and time learn, depending on where you are in the country and joining us. Uh, Elizabeth, thank you so much for being on with us and sharing your experience and your knowledge and the work that you're doing. It's uh, so vibrant and so brilliant to hear what's happening and how these all, these all things actually work together and how we might think of ways that we can continue to expand. Um, but this was a brilliant, brilliant opportunity to learn. So I Thank am you. so appreciative. Thank you all um, so much for having me. I want to let everyone know, um, definitely once the recording's available, we will share that out so everybody can um, continue to use that. And uh, also hopefully keep an eye out in the fall. We'll have another doctoral candidate who's going to um, kind of take the baton. Uh, Miranda Coffey is going to kind of move into this space and, and continue to grow this and expand this. So we're lucky to see that move forward with the Burnett Symposium speaker series. Thank you so much, everyone. Elizabeth, thank you for being on. I am so grateful. And thank you for everybody that joined us today. With that, I'm going to go ahead and close us out. All right. Take care. Bye, everyone. Thank you.